I'll give you some uh, three points here in John chapter 5. I'll give you while you're turning there the uh, background of the text in John chapter 5. We're at the pool of Bethesda and there's a lame man for 38 years that's by the pool of Bethesda. And uh, he can't get up. He can't make his way into the water to get healed. And Jesus came by on the Sabbath day and when he came by he asked him, Wilt thou be made whole? And when he asked him to be made whole, he said, well, I can't get into the water. I have nobody to help me in. Jesus wasn't concerned about whether or not he uh, had an excuse why he couldn't be made whole. He just said, wilt thou be made whole? Jesus healed him and made him alive, made him walk, made him run, if you will. And that was on the Sabbath day, and that was against the law to carry furniture on the Sabbath day. Well, uh, only furniture he had was the bed that he was laying on. He rolled up his bed, and he was carrying his bed, so he got in trouble. And he said, why, who made you to sin? And it was Jesus that made him to sin, if you will, uh, because the Pharisees had made that law. So they captured Jesus, or they sought to slay him in verse 16. And I want to read in verse 31 to 39 the account that Jesus tells tells to them the reason or the evidence that I am who I said I am. They said, why did you heal that man? He said, because I'm the son of God. Why did you do it on the Sabbath day? He said, because I'm the son of God. And to be the son of God makes you equal with God. And they knew that and they said, blasphemy, me. No, you're not. He said, I am the Messiah. You're looking at the Messiah. And he gives three witnesses or three evidences here in John chapter 5 that I want to point out and take my seat. Reading in John uh, uh, 531. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There's another that bear witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnessed of me is true. Ye sent unto John, that's John the Baptist, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. I'm glad that God still sends men to tell lost men that there's somebody that'll save them. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That's what John the Baptist was doing. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in this light. They were willing for a, a little bit to listen to what John had to say until they saw who he was referring to. Oh, just an old carpenter's son. Oh, just somebody from Nazareth, not the Messiah that they uh, thought he should have been. And that was one witness. He said, but I've got a greater witness than that of John for the works which the Father have given me to finish, the same works that I do. They bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself which have sent me, he bore witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Ye have not his word abiding in you for whom he has sent him ye believe not. Finishing our reading. Search the scriptures, he tells them. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. Just having merely the copy of God's word will not offer eternal life. But he says, and they are they which testify of me. He says, you have the scriptures, search them. And you'll find out that the scriptures tell about me. They witness or testify about me. Number one, I see here, human witness. It was the first evidence that God gave, Jesus gave. If you will, let's pretend we're in a courtroom. Jesus his own trial. He said, if I tell you about myself, it's not true. Now, he'd tell the truth, but he knew that fickled mind of men, we wouldn't believe what he had to say anyway. So he brought some people to the stand. He brought John the Baptist to the stand. And he said, human witness, John the Baptist told you about me. He has testified about me. He was the witness about me. And us preachers, we're real good at painting the picture of John the Baptist. We say, oh man, he was a wild man. And oh, he had a big old long beard. And Oh, he had a double-breasted camel hair suit. And oh, he had honey in his beard. And, and grasshopper legs sticking out of his mouth. This, oftentimes we picture and paint a, a John the Baptist just a wild man. And maybe he was. And maybe, maybe that is how his table manners were. I'm not really sure. It's good preaching and I enjoy it. But I never found John the Baptist telling us about that. I never saw... John the Baptist never said, I've been eating honey. John the Baptist never said, I've been eating grasshoppers. John the Baptist never said, I'm a wild man man. He never said, look, all I have to wear is camel hair. He never told us that he was from a tribe of Levi. He never told us that his daddy was a priest. He never told us that his dad had money, that he came from a wealthy home. We get all that from reading elsewhere in the scripture. What did John the Baptist say when he showed up on the scene? He didn't come to tell you where he was from, and neither did I. He didn't come to tell you who he was, and neither did I. He didn't come to tell you about his family and how many children he had, and neither did I. He didn't come to tell you how much money he had, and neither did I. He didn't come to tell you about where he's been and what he's been doing what he's been eating and neither did I there's only one message that John the Baptist had and it was behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world 
He said, whose shoes? I'm unworthy to stoop down and unlatch it. He said, I must decrease and he must increase. John the Baptist testified not about who he was or what he's been doing, but he said, prepare the way. The Lord is coming. There was somebody to tell somebody that Jesus is who he says he is and he can take away the sin. He can save a life. He can change a life. He can make the difference tonight. Not John the Baptist, but Jesus. <laughs> Moving along, not only do we see, and what's the application for us? Friend, we ought to be testifying that Jesus is who he says he is, friend. <laughs> not only that, but he said, I've got something better than that of John. He said, John, you can go take your seat. John said, they said, who's Jesus? He said, he's the Savior. He's the, he's the spotless, sinless Lamb of God. I, he takes away the sin of the world. Oh, he's the Messiah. He's really here. They let him go down. He says, I would like to give you some else. Right? They called another witness. The Bible says in verse 36, I've got a greater witness than that of John. They got something better. John, you can take your seat. He said, the works, <laughs> the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do. He says, all right, you don't believe what John the Baptist, you don't believe what I said. You don't believe what John the Baptist said. What about the works that I do? So he allowed his works to come and take the seat. And the works testify, the works give witness that Jesus is who he says he is. Now what is the works of God? What is the works of Jesus? Hey, the works of God, the works of Jesus, they are miracles. Hey, the, he don't work like a man works. He, he don't work like we could work. If that's the case, he wouldn't get all the glory. Why would he do what me and you can do? Every time I've ever seen God move, it's always been on a scale that's far greater than man can do. On a scale far greater than what I can do. He's always, go he always exceeds my expectation. He always does more. He always does better. He does it that way so that he gets the glory. He'll not operate as a man. Oh no. When God operates, it's a miracle. He said, did you not know that the man for 38 years was laid lame by the pit. He said did you not know? And they knew by the way if you, if you trace back the history of the text, those Jewish leaders and Pharisees, they would go by the pool of Bethesda. There was many sick there and they would offer prayers to them. Oh prayer for you and prayer for you. But there was no power of God in it. Oh but when God showed, hey, when God showed up in his life, oh it wasn't the same as everybody else. It wasn't just an offered prayer. Jesus said wilt thou be made whole. And I don't believe the man was limping. I don't believe he had a hard time getting up. I believe the reason he didn't first know the name of Jesus is because when he healed him he took off running. I believe he was so excited with this newfound miracle that he went to running just as good as anyone had ever ran before. And he said do you not see that the things that I do can no other man do. All of y'all went down there. All of y'all prayed for him before but he still laid lame by the pool. 38 years with no legs. I showed up in 38 seconds. He's a running laps around the building. Hey, what Jesus does, can't nobody else do. Hey, the hand of God works miracles in people's lives that nobody else can take credit for. A friend, I don't know where you was when Jesus came and made you whole, but I remember where I was. I remember the pit that I was in. I remember where he found me. I remember where I was. I might as well have been paralyzed in my pit. I might as well have been a lame man. I might as well have been a blind man. But Jesus came by and he said, Wilt thou be made whole? I never forget where I was. I never forget what he done. He did a miracle in my life. Oh, now I can see. Oh, now I can run. Oh, now I can hear. Why? Because what God did in my life, it's shown up the hand of God miracle and they may deny Jesus they may deny God but there's one thing you can't deny and one of my friends is here that's known me since a baby he cannot deny oh friend he may deny God he may be able to deny Jesus he may deny the resurrection on the seat he can't deny the change has been made in this old boy's life oh it's a miracle tonight and if you've been saved tonight I'm looking at a house 
full of miracles tonight. A hand of God miracle. You know how I know he is, who he says he is, because I see his hand and all the changed life tonight. Oh, God, I need a miracle. Oh, God, I need to see that you're real. Oh, God, I just don't know. I, I just don't know if you hear my prayers. I, I just don't know if you're there. But I, and I'm not making light of our troubles. i got some I've been praying about too tonight. Uh, oh, but God, I need to see. Let me see a miracle. i got a good idea for you. If you want to see a good miracle tonight, when you leave here, we'll be out early enough. Go by the biggest wall first wall. Can find by the biggest mirror you can find hanging in the longest hallway of your house. Uh, and every time you go down the hallway of that house, uh, I want you to know you ain't looking uh, at you, friend, uh, but you're looking uh, at the hand of God. Uh, you're looking at a short enough miracle. Uh, you want a miracle in your life? Uh, look in the mirror, child. Uh, oh, praise God. Uh, if you've been born again, uh, you are a miracle tonight. Use a miracle. I want him to answer more prayers, but if he don't, friend, I'm a miracle tonight. You're a miracle tonight. The lame man was a miracle tonight. I remember where I was. Wilt thou be made whole? When you tell somebody about Jesus, tell them about how he changed your life. They can deny, look, they may believe in the Big Bang. They, they, they may believe that there's no man that can raise from the, they can believe that all they want. They can doubt if they want. You know what God left? <laughs> Hey, Jesus went on home. Lame man stuck around. Hey, even after they put him on the cross, uh, even after they buried him, when he went back home and they never could see him no more, them Pharisees had to watch that man from those 38 years lame run all around the building, run all around the city. And no matter how long it took until God took them Pharisees out, uh, they had to watch a miracle of God to say, I can deny God. I can deny Jesus, but I can't deny the change. Hey, the world needs to see the change in your life. <laughs> lastly, and finishing up, lastly, his, his works leave. Now, friend, I believe he is who he says he is. I, so, and I know Charlie, no, C, Brother CT knows me from before. He can testify that man ain't the same as what he was. Some of you know each other before. <laughs> And you know, my husband ain't the man he used to be. My wife ain't the man he used to be. God changed. Well, but he leaves. I said, no, that won't do. That won't do. So he brought his word. Lastly, his word. Just a couple minutes. Search the scriptures, he said. For in them you think you have eternal life. But they are they which testify me. He says, I got the Bible. Y'all got the Bible. And it is the Bible. Look, without this, I wouldn't know who Jesus is. Without this, I wouldn't know to come to church. Without this, I wouldn't know how to act. Without this, I wouldn't know how he loves me. Without this, I wouldn't know where he came from. Without this, I wouldn't know where I come from and where I'm going unless I be saved. Look, the Bible is very important in the Christian's life. Very quickly, I can't go there and I won't. But uh, Lazarus and the rich man, they die and go to, one goes to hell, one goes to paradise. The man, uh, the rich man lifted up his eyes in torment. He said, Father Abraham, send him, send him back from the grave to go to my father's house. Luke 16. Send him back. Let him tell everybody that, that this place is real. Let him say, he wants somebody to go be evidence number one. <laughs> he said, let him go back and just tell him that this place is real. Eternity is real. He said, no. He said, let him go back from the grave. If he goes back, I'm paraphrasing. If he goes back from the grave, surely they'll believe him. Evidence number two. Wouldn't it be a miracle if a man that died came back alive? <laughs> Some of y'all get that when we leave. Hey, wouldn't it be a miracle if somebody that was dead to come to life? Praise the Lord. They wanted evidence number two. Abraham said, nope. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Luke 16. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Who's Moses and the prophets? Moses long gone by this time. Some of the prophets, I, I tried my best to figure it out, but most of them's gone. <laughs> Who are they? 
It was the scripture that they had at those times. Moses penned the Pentateuch. Moses was a picture of the law. The prophets are a picture of the rest, telling the, uh, telling the, the future of Christ. And he said they've got Moses and they've got the prophets. Abraham said they've got the Bible. Let them hear the Bible. If they'll hear the Bible, then they'll be saved. They'll not be saved though a man comes back from the grave. They'll not be saved though, though somebody just tells them, no, it's got to be a hard knowledge. They have to believe what the Bible says. I thank God for the scripture. The scripture is what we believe. Anytime I doubt and anytime I'm reminded of how wicked I used to be, I just continue to believe the scripture. I got one minute. I found this pocket knife by the dumpster at my house. It was muddy. It was tore up. Somebody had thrown it away. I found it. I thought it was junk too. I threw it in the four-wheeler satchel. A couple days later, my son Uno, Isaiah, he said, Dad, you remember that pocket knife? It's this very pocket knife. You remember that pocket knife that you found? I said, oh, yeah. He said, what are you going to do with that? I thought he wanted it. I said, well, let me go get it. I forgot all about it. I thought it was trash. I thought somebody throwed it away. I thought it wasn't no importance. I, I thought it wasn't good for nothing. Why would somebody throw something away if it was of high value? Why, why would somebody throw something away if it had some good? I, my goodness, I, I wouldn't throw nothing away if it was really good. So I thought it wasn't no good either. So I, I got to cleaning it up, and I opened it up. Now, security, I'm going to stay up here, okay? I'm not going nowhere. <laughs> I know, y'all walk in the building, y'all's in the back, somebody's behind me, I'm sure, in a trap door, okay? I know that. Y'all, y'all's preacher pretty, I mean, people know him, I get it. I ain't leaving this platform. It's me and the piano. Listen, I ain't got much time now, look. I said, I, that ain't, can't be no good. I'm cleaning it off. My younger brother calls me. My younger brother was in the military too. When he was overseas in Iraq, they would issue him knives to carry when he was in Iraq. I'm cleaning it off, trying to get the mud out of it. It wouldn't barely work, Brother Steve. And, and I was cleaning. My brother happens to call me. And he said, what you doing? I said, I'm cleaning this knife off. It must be a piece of junk. It was bound by the dumpster. He said, well, what's it say? Whose is it? I said, well, it's got a name on here that says Benchmade. Yeah, some of y'all know. I said, it's got a name on here, Bench Bay. My brother said, ooh, that's high quality. <laughs> he, says, that's, he says, that's a good knife. He said, that's high quality. I said, no, it can't be. Somebody throwed it away. He said, no, I'm telling you, that knife right there, he said, they issued us those in military. Them's high quality. <laughs> I said, huh. I said, huh. My brother, stay with me. I got them snorting and carrying on in the, the amen corner. I'm going to go over here where the church people's at. I'm trying to finish up. Now, look, I, I, I want to honor your time. It's my, this is one of my greatest privileges. I want to honor my time. Now, y'all got to listen because I get in trouble. Okay. He says this bench made is high quality. My brother testified that the knife was worthwhile. Yeah. No, it can't be. It's junk. I said, I tell you what, if it is what you say it is, I'm going to put it to the test. I tell you what, if it is what you say it is, I'll find out. I'm going I'm to prove it. I'm going to prove this knife. I'm going to find out if it really is what you say it is. So I find out you could send it off and somebody take care of it. It was their knife. I sent it off and said, hey, is this, uh, my brother told me this was a good knife. Is this a good knife or not? I want to know. And so they, a few days later, they sent it back to me in a box. They come back with a little manual in there too. And I picked it up. It wasn't a new knife. It was the same knife. Still had the same scars on it. Still had the same uh, 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 ability. Still the same look. It, it looked the same, but it wasn't the same. It was cleaned up. It was working. Matter of fact, it worked real good. <laughs> and they never done that before, friend. I could barely get it open. You see that? Some of y'all missed that. You was looking down. Look. And this y'all, look, it came back sharp as I've ever fe felt a night before with the same blade that it had. I put this thing to the test. I said, if you say it's really worthwhile, I don't believe it. Somebody throw it away and said it was worth nothing. But if you said it was worthwhile, I'm going to put it to the test. When I put it to the test, I found out that the works that it does. I, oh, that's a miracle, friend. Uh, this ain't the same knife. Surely, uh, this ain't the same knife I found uh, down by the dumpster. Surely, uh, uh, it can't do what you said it did. Oh, not only could it do what my brother said, uh, oh, but it did so much more. Uh, I found out that the works that this knife does, it's a miracle. And I told you, when I got it out of the box, it came with a manual, too. Uh, I opened up that manual. Uh, it told me what its name was. Uh, told me how to keep it sharp. Uh, told me how to use 
praise it. Hey, hey, tell me what it's good for. Uh, uh, friend, I'm here to tell you tonight. Uh, you know what we need in this world? Uh, we just need somebody uh, to tell somebody uh, that Jesus really is high quality. Uh, and let him put him to the hey, hey, let him put him to the test and find out. Uh, he can do a miracle in your life. Uh, and he's left you a manual. Hey, tell you who he is. Uh, tell you how to stay sharp. Uh, tell you how to live the Christian life. Lord, I love you and I thank you, God, for the evidence that you left that says Jesus really is who he says he is. God, I believe there's people in this building that have had the touch of God in their life that can testify to the fact that Jesus did a miracle. I thank God for my Bible. I thank God for my friends. I thank God for church. I thank God for Jesus and the, the work he did in my life. Do a work here in these people's lives this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, man, it's a joy to be here tonight. I'm going to invite you to open a Bible to the book of Daniel tonight. And once you found your place there, why don't we stand for just a minute? Uh, it'll be our last chance for the next two hours to stretch our legs. And so uh, we might as well get that done. I'm just kidding about that. It's only an hour and 45. But Daniel, I just lost them all, friend. It's over, all right? Daniel chapter 2 in the Word of God. I'd like to read just a few verses of Scripture tonight. We're going to consider a little bit more in this text. Man, by the way, what a blessing, Brother Travis. Thank you so very much. Let's thank the Lord one more time for that. I really, really, really uh, certainly appreciated the Word of God tonight. Encourage me and help me. Daniel chapter 2 in the Word of God. The Bible says, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers, the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream. And my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dreams, and we will show the interpretation. Boy, you love that confidence, don't you? The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, Well, the thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream... With the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Can we just stop and say, what a blessing this guy is. <laughs> Verse 6, but if ye show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that ye would gain the time because you see the thing is gone from me. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore... Tell me the dream, and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. And verse number 10 is what's got me interested tonight. I want you to notice what he says. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king this matter. Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. I want you to notice this little phrase. The Chaldeans answered and they said, There is not a man upon the earth. Tonight I'd like to preach on this subject. There's no help on this earth. There's no help on this earth. Father, for the next few moments, help me to say what you once said tonight. 
Father, I want to thank you tonight for what we've already experienced, what we've enjoyed. Lord, I thank you so much for what you've done in my heart tonight through the word preached, through the word sung, through the testimonies. God, I pray for these next few moments that you would fill me with thy spirit. Give me exactly what I need to say in a way that will bless your church, your people. And Father, for all of this, we're going to give you all the glory, all the honor and credit because you certainly are worthy. We thank you for this time together tonight. Speak through your word. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you so much for standing tonight. Please be seated. I uh, am interested sometimes in some of these shows that come on TV. One of them that I really like is 911. When somebody goes through a crisis, somebody goes through a problem, there's something that has been ingrained in us since we were kids. When you got a problem, when you got an issue, when you got something that's over your head, you got a problem, an emergency, call 911. I love watching these shows because the people now today that respond to the 911 calls, you honestly would be better not to call a lot of times. A lot of times they can't help. They can't do something for you. But here's what I know. When we get into a situation that is over our head and we get into a situation or a problem that causes us great distress and causes us to stress out about the situation that we're going through, generally all of us will look to something or we'll look to somebody and we'll ask for help. We'll say, can you help me? I remember about six and a half, seven years ago, we were building our home and I was overseeing the project and my daughter and I would drive every day to that project. It was close to where we lived and every day we would drive there and, and they were just cutting in the driveway and they were starting some of the foundational work and I wanted to see it. It was late one night, it was about six o'clock, it was just getting a little darker and I was pulling in and I missed the driveway. And I came in and, and I was in a truck. The truck was literally only about a year, a year old. And I came in, but I came in in such a way that the two tires were here and one tire was sticking up. And I think I only had three tires on the ground and, and we were like this. And I was on the lower end and I said, Sydney, don't move. I said, I'm going to slide over to your side and I'm going to put the weight over there. And I'm going to reach over and I'm going to, I mean, literally, you should have seen this. This was awesome. I'm going to throw this thing in reverse and I'm going to try to back this thing out. And I'm sitting there and she said, don't you think we ought to get some help? <laughs> and I said, honey, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> it's me. I'm the guy. Yeah. Yeah. She looked at me. She said, I'm calling mom. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I know. When you get in a situation, when you get in trouble, the person that you call is generally the person that you believe can do something about the problem or the situation that you find yourself in. I just try to lay a little foundation to get enough courage up to preach, all right? So, so watch, in this passage of scripture, what we find here is we find a horrible dream that this man, Nebuchadnezzar, has. The Bible tells us he's in the second year of his reign. The first year was known as the ascension year. The second year was where they would actually start to measure his kingdom. And they would actually start to say, he's our king. The reason why is because the three previous kings to him never made it out of their ascension year. They were executed. They were murdered. One was toppled by his own son, poisoned by his own son. So watch, in this empire, to make it to the second year was a really big deal. He's made it now to his second year. He's ascended up. His kingdom seems to be on the rise. Things are going well. You can read about it in Daniel chapter 1. He's even making conquests, and he's going, and he's bringing some of the most brilliant minds 
from around the world and bringing them back to Babylon. And he's going to build some incredible structures. He's going to build an incredible kingdom. He's going to build an expansive kingdom. He's going to bring these scientists. He's going to bring these astrologers. He is bringing the wisest people from around the world into his kingdom. And he is building a strong, strong, strong empire. He's in his second year. But the Bible tells us in this passage of Scripture, although he seems to be on top of the world, although he seems to be in complete control, although it seems that everything is going well, Shakespeare had it right. Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. He's there and everything is going his way. Everything is going right. But he lays his head down on his pillow one night. When he goes to sleep, the Bible says he has a horrible, horrible dream. This dream, and we'll talk about it later, we're not going to preach on this dream, but this dream, basically, he sees a multi-metallic man in this dream. He dreams of this multi-metallic man, and you have to understand in this day that dreams were much more than what they are today. Dreams were almost mediums into the future. In other words, you could connect what you dreamed at night to your future. And so here is Nebuchadnezzar. He dreams of this huge multi-metallic man. He has a head of gold. He has arms of silver. He has thighs of brass. He has uh, legs of iron and he has feet of clay and iron. So in his mind, he's thinking, this represents my kingdom. This represents my power. This represents my authority. Everything's going well in his dream But then all of a sudden, a huge stone is cut out of the mountain. And when that stone is cut out of the mountain, it rolls down the hill and it hits this multi-metallic man and it smashes it to smithereens. That's in the Hebrew. I mean, smashes it into, into absolutely smithereens. And so here is Nebuchadnezzar. He's on top of his world. Everything's going well. But then all of a sudden in his dream, this rock comes rolling down and now his kingdom has been crushed. Now his kingdom has been annihilated. Now his kingdom is gone. This is not the message, but let me tell you what this is all about. This is about the kingdoms of this world. You see, the entire book of Daniel is about the kingdoms of this world. But watch, it's about where man rules, God always overrules. And it's about that one day, that stone, which has been disallowed of the builders, one day is going to come and literally is going to crush the kingdoms of this world. His name is King Jesus, and he will rule, he will reign. He is the Ancient of Days. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. Where man rules, God overrules. That, that's the interpretation. Not the message, but it's a good talk. Here's Nebuchadnezzar. He's dreaming this dream. This multi-metallic man, his kingdom has now been destroyed. So he wakes up, heart pounding, fearful. Remember, the three kings before him, their kingdoms have been snuffed out in their first year. He's only made it to his second. He's paranoid. He's in shock. He's in concern. He's probably beefing up his security by this point. He's thinking, I'm next. And this dream is showing me what my future is going to be. He has this horrible dream. So what do you do? When you think your world is about to fall apart, what do you do when everything you put your trust and hope in is literally mentally and physically about to come apart right before you. Here's what you do. You call for help. help. And that's what he does. He has this horrible dream. But then I want you to see he gives this hopeless demand. He brings these incredible minds of the day into his chambers. He says, listen, I've got a problem, guys. I'm having nightmares. I'm I'm struggling with sleep at night. The Bible says his sleep break from him. It means he couldn't get to sleep at night. So you know that the human body without 72 hours of sleep, if you go 72 hours without sleep, you begin to go into psychosis. 
And if you go beyond that, you literally can begin to lose your mind. Here's King Nebuchadnezzar. He's not sleeping. He's not functioning. And he's having this horrible nightmare. So he calls for help. Who comes? Well, the Bible tells us the astrologers come. The sorcerers come. The magicians come. The Chaldeans. The Chaldeans would be the Rhodes scholars of today. The smartest people in the room. These are the most educated people. These are the wisest people. Watch. These are the doctorate degrees. These are the people who've got it all figured out. If you have questions, they had answers. How advanced were they? Well, they're the ones that discovered our 365-day calendar. I mean, this, this came from Babylon. These were intelligent men. They studied the stars. They studied the patterns of the universe. They studied the seasons. In fact, they're the ones that discovered four seasons. I mean, these were brilliant, brilliant minds. So what do they do? King Nebuchadnezzar says, if anybody can help me, these are the guys. These are the ones that can help me. So he brings them in. These guys had a trick up their sleeve, though. In this day, they had something that was, they had invented called dream manuals. People would have dreams. They would come in with these dreams and these guys would say, tell me your dream. They would say their dream and they'd say, I'll be right back. And they'd go back to their dream manual and pull a manual out. And they would say, here's the answer to your dream. Here's the interpretation of this dream. Of course, you know that they charge for that because you can't give such a service away for free. I mean, that's going to cost you something. you got to sow a seed of faith to get that. We won't talk about that. These dream manuals, they would pull them and these dream manuals would help people interpret their dreams. And so watch, there's a teenage boy by the name of Daniel who's been taken from his country. He has three friends who've been renamed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Guess what group they were in? They were in this group. They were part of the Chaldeans. They were part of this intellectual elite. This was a group of young men that had been taken, watch, out of their society, out of their culture, out of their homes, out of their religion where they have relied on God and have been dumped in Babylon right in the middle of all this mess. So here comes the king. The king can't sleep at night. The king says, I'm ticked off. 72 hours without sleep will make a madman out of anybody. And what does he do? He says, here's the deal, guys. If you're so intelligent, if you're so smart, I've been dreaming this really bad dream. And I like what he said. The thing is gone from me. It doesn't mean that he forgot it. It just means he wasn't going to tell them. Here's when Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, you don't get to become the most powerful man in the world by being a dummy. What does he say? Here's his thinking. His thinking is this. If you can't interpret my dreams, if you can't tell me my dreams, you can't interpret it. Watch. If you can't tell me the past, what makes me think you're going to interpret the future? So if you're so smart, If you're so wise, if you've got it all put together, here's the deal. Tell me what I dreamed. Don't just tell me the interpretation. Tell me the dream. I don't want to hear your dream manuals. I know what you guys do. I know that this this is trickery. I know that this is just magic. I know what you do. Listen, I no, no, no. I need real answers. Watch. I need real answers because it's keeping me up at night. I need something that can help my soul at this point. I need something that can really give me truth and real answers. I don't want just the dream manuals, guys. They go away. They come back and they say, King, listen. We have talked to the wisest of the wise. And here's the problem, King. We've come to this conclusion. That um, there's nobody on this earth that can do what you're asking. King, there's plenty of people that can interpret a dream if you'll just tell us what the dream is. But King, if you're not willing to tell us a dream, 
There's nobody on this entire planet, there's nobody on this entire earth that can tell you your dream, therefore they cannot tell you the interpretation of your dream. King, this is a hopeless demand. King, there is no help on this earth. What does the king say? Well, nobody can help me. Everybody's going to die. He's a good guy, real good guy. Everybody's going to die. Here's the problem. There happened to be four Hebrew boys who feared God who were part of this cabinet. There were four Hebrew boys that were now condemned to death because there was nobody on the earth that could give an answer to the problem that they were facing. The king is calling for help, but there is no help on this earth. And that's important to remember. There is no help on this earth. I want you to see, thirdly, the heavenly dependence. Come to chapter 2 and look at verse number 13 for just a moment. The Bible says in verse number 13, the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. Notice what he said. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Daniel says, listen, if this is such a troubling dream, is it worth killing the smartest people in the kingdom? Maybe just give us just... A little more time, and the king grants it. The king's going to give him more time. So what do you do? When you have time, and everything is on the line, what do you do when there's no help on this earth, and everybody who's the smartest people in the room have been tapped into and exhausted? They have literally looked into every manual they've got, and there are no answers. What do you do? Now I want you to hear me. Look what the Bible says in verse number 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hanani, Michelle, and Azariah. I love this, by the way. While they were in private, they still used their Hebrew names. They never forgot who they really were. They stayed in touch with who they were because those names meant something. Those names were representative of the God that they worshipped in Israel. Their parents had named them. Their parents had put something in them. And when they were taken to Babylon, although they were in Babylon, Babylon never got in them, although they lived inside of Babylon. So here they are in this private meeting. Watch, everything's on the line. You're about to lose your life. What do you do? Verse 18, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. You read this text, you read this story, it's one of the great ones in the Old Testament, but the Bible says there's a time to act and there's a time to pray. And the Bible tells us that these young men do not lean on their own understanding. They do not lean on their own wisdom. But instead, when there is no help on this earth, what do you do? Well, you better look higher than this earth. And the Bible said they call a heaven-sent prayer meeting and they ask God for mercy and they call upon the God of heaven. What happens? Well, God reveals the dream. God reveals the dream to Daniel. God reveals the interpretation to Daniel. And now all of a sudden, Daniel sends to Arioch and he says, I've got the dream. I've got the interpretation. Put me in front of the king. Teenage boy. Let me say something to you real quickly. There's more power in a teenage boy that's in touch with heaven than a grown man who's got all this education that this world has to offer. I'd rather have a teenage boy in touch with heaven because he's got God on his side. God reveals it to him. Daniel stands in front of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, 
looks at him. I want you to hear what Daniel said. The king, verse 26, the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Look at your Bible, verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. You ought to underline this. But there is a God in heaven. Hey, hey, listen, when there's no help on this earth, I've got good news for you. There is a God in heaven. When you have exhausted all your resources, when you have searched for all the answers, when life has brought you to your knees and it's keeping you up at night and you don't know who to turn to and you've asked everybody you know to ask and they keep giving you the same answer and it's not answering the questions of life, I've got good news for you. When there is no help on this earth, there is a God in heaven tonight. There sure is. What do they do? Daniel gives this answer. Daniel gives glory to God. You ought to read all of this. And I love, I love, I love this text. And here's why. And I've preached this tonight for 26 and a half minutes to tell you this. Here is the message. Every one of us will come to places in our lives. There's nobody that can help us. And watch, even the people that should be able to help us, even the people who are supposed to have the answers, they come to us, and what they say to us, it leaves us frustrated. Watch, it leaves us frustrated and angry and lashing out at people and sleepless. And causing us to make idle threats. It's all right here. His name is Nebuchadnezzar. If you want to see the wisdom that this world will give you and where it will leave you, it'll leave you angry. It'll leave you frustrated. It'll leave you lashing out at people. It'll leave you literally making enemies of everybody around you. And here's the problem. They don't have the answer. They don't have the help that you need. I am so thankful tonight. The story doesn't end there. The story doesn't end with a helpless earth. The story ends with a young teenage boy that says, although you may not be able to help me, and although you may not have the answer to my problem, I learned something as a little boy in Israel. I learned something at my mother's knee. I don't understand it all, but I know this. There is this God in heaven. And there's this God in heaven that can reveal things when nobody has an answer for it. There's a God in heaven that can do things when nobody can do something about my situation. Hey, tonight, church, here's what I want to say. Stop calling everybody in the world when your world falls apart and call on the God that is in heaven who is above all of it tonight. Can I tell you this? God can give you what nobody else can give you. Nobody else could give this answer. You had to have divine intervention. God can give you what nobody else can give you. Hey, I'm liking this. God can go places with you that nobody else can go. You see, these three boys, this is the first time these four boys' faith is going to be tested just a couple chapters later, same old Nebuchadnezzar is going to lose his mind again. Yeah. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to build a statue of himself. And he's going to say, listen, everybody's got to bow down. And everybody's got to worship this false image. But there are three Hebrew boys who, watch this, in chapter 2 found out there was a God in heaven. Yeah. And that gave them the courage and inspiration in chapter 4 to stand up and say, no, 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 we're not going to bow down before you. We're not going to stand in front of this image. We don't care what you put on us. You're going into the fiery furnace. That's okay because we have a God in heaven who steps into fiery furnaces and goes places with us. Nobody else can go. God can give you what nobody else can give you. God can go places with you that nobody else can go with you. 
God can grant favor to you and nobody else can grant. Daniel, you read about this man. Just a few chapters later, he's an old man living in Babylon. He's a teenager in this story, about 14, 15 years old. But the next time we read a significant story of Daniel, he's 70 years old. And there's some people that don't like his politics. And they say to Daniel, Daniel, you shouldn't be praying. In fact, we're going to get a decree passed. And that decree is going to outlaw prayer. But you have to understand something. This boy's been calling on the God of heaven since he was a child. And God has showed up for him again and again and again and done things for him that nobody else could do for him. And God has gone places with him that nobody else could go. And so now all these idle threats show up and they say, listen, if you start to pray, you're going in the lion's den. Oh, not that. I love Daniel, full of faith, full of boldness. Daniel opens his windows. <laughs> he doesn't pray in a closet secretly. He says, boys, let me just go ahead and open these windows because you already know I'm praying. Might as well let you all know that I'm praying. Faces Jerusalem and he prays. The Bible says that they take him and they cast him into the lion's den. And there he is in the lion's den about to be consumed. I like what old Charles Spurgeon said about this. He said, you ought to always remember this. The lion in you is greater than the lion outside of you. <laughs> Daniel found out that night that there was a God in heaven still. And that God in heaven could take him through the fiery furnace. That God in heaven could take him through the idle threats. That God in heaven could take him to the lion's den and he could walk out unscathed. I'm telling you tonight, there are places and times in our lives where you look around and there's nowhere to stand. And everybody's against you and there's no answers. I have good news. You're in good company and you're in good shape because there is a God in heaven tonight. So I ask you tonight, what's keeping you up at night? I ask you tonight, what's causing you stress? I ask you tonight, what battles have you sought? And what person have you gone to that still can't answer the questions of life? I want you to hear me, beloved church. Yes. You're a prime candidate tonight yes. to discover what Daniel has discovered. And I want to tell you tonight, I'm nowhere near as faithful as Daniel, but I can raise my hand and testify and tell you tonight, I've discovered this. There really is a God in heaven. Yes. And he really can intervene. And he really can do something about your situation. Hey, stop going to the wrong person. Ask him for help. There's a God in heaven tonight. Do you know what we need? We need a revival. But listen, we need a revival of dependency upon God. A revival where we say, God, I, I thank you that there are good doctors. Are you listening? I thank you that there are good doctors. But, but I, Lord, I'm really thankful that you're my great physician. And God, I'm thankful for all the help you sit in my life and all that's wonderful, all that's good. But my problems exceed the help that's around me. I need something bigger. I need something better. I need something that can, somebody that can do something about this. I need the God of heaven. I'm telling you tonight, God is attracted to people who will literally say, God, I trust you no matter what because I believe that you're the God that's above this entire situation. So church, as we begin revival this week, Maybe, just maybe, it'd be a good night as we extend this invitation and whoever's going to play tonight, I'll ask you to come. And as they play tonight, here's what I want to ask you. Whatever the situation is, whatever the problem is, whatever is keeping you up at night, whatever is causing you anger, frustration, Bitterness, whatever it might be, 
maybe tonight we could just flood these altars. And here's what we could say on this opening night of revival. God, I'm tonight declaring my dependency upon you. God, tonight I'm thankful for good people, but God, they can only take me so far. God, I need you. God, I need you. I need the God of Daniel. I need him to be my God tonight.